What does it mean to be a true American? When I asked this question to myself, the first things that popped into my mind were the Bill of Rights, the people around me, the history of this nation, and just overall, just the beauty of the land, you know, and the opportunities that are given here. But I asked that same question about other nationalities, about other nations. One nation that came to my mind was Russia. Then I asked, what does it mean to be a true Russian? And come to find out, Russians have a saying. They actually have a saying that's called, what does it mean to be true Grozny? And Grozny means, in Russian, really, what is a true Russian? <laughs> when you first think of Russia in a historical standpoint, you know, personally, what comes to your mind? If I could probably predict what you think, it probably would be Joseph Stalin, Nikita Khrushchev, the Cold War, the Gulags, <clears throat> Vladimir Lenin, and Karl Marx. Maybe those are the names that probably pop in your head. At least those are the first ones that popped in my head before I did a lot more research into this. But I, what I bet most of you didn't know was that for hundreds of years, Russia was an imperial monarchy. <clears throat> And the family that ruled over Russia was the Romanov family for the, la the, the start of the 17th century. But to go over hundreds of years would take a lot of time and in this lecture I'm only going to be going over the highest and the best times of Imperial Russia, Imperial Russia which was in the 19th century. From the reign of Alexander I to the ascension of Nicholas the first, to the fall of the monarchy, and the last czar, Nicholas the second, is what I'll be going over inside of this lecture. I will do my best to hit the key points and the key details, but for the most part, just sit back and enjoy the ride. So the first question I had asked was, what does it mean to be a true Grosnik? Well, you would have to look at what is a czar, their king, their their leader of everything well the, f the first thing you have to ask is that well a czar is somebody who's God's appointed king over the people of Russia that's just how the people viewed him he was God's king he was the man who was in charge and the czar in his rule must rule like God intended and the people believed heavily in that belief without that you have no religion you have no uh, nation for the czar but where did the ideology come from? You know, where did these these Rus or these Russians get this idea from? <clears throat> well, Russia was actually established. Uh, their first city was Kiev. They were actually known as the Rus Kiev by a few princes back in the uh, 1100 or the 10th century. And one of those princes that ruled Russia was named Prince Vladimir of Kiev. And what he noticed at that time was that the people needed something. They were missing something. It was a religion, some type or form of hope for the people. So Vladimir, knowing this, sent emissaries all over the world. He sent them to Greece, to Western Europe. He sent them to Asia, and he sent them to Constantinople for the Eastern Roman Empire or where they were known as the Byzantine Empire and when they all came back he even sent them to the lands of Judea let me not forget that one as well and when they came back the only one that stood into his mind was Constantinople now there is a book that goes into more detail than what I'll give you uh, the book is called The Tales of the Bygone Years it's in the Russian it's a Russian in the Russian Chronicle if you look up this book it will go into great detail of the origins and the Rus people of Kiev but to give you a, a summed up version of this um, when the emissary came back from Constantinople uh, that was where and if I get the quote right it would be the city of Constantinople and the churches and the cathedrals over there were so beautiful and magnificent that if 
God were to be anywhere, he would be here in the city of Constantinople. The moment that Vladimir had heard this, he knew that he must go visit there, that he must go see this land for himself. And when he, when he did, he established that Orthodox Christianity was what the Russian people were going to follow. All of this and everything is going to be inside of that chronicle. It's a very good story. Uh, I highly recommend people to go to go and read it. And maybe in the future I'll do uh, the origins or whatnot. And I'll talk about who the Russian people came from, where they came from, and who they were. <clears throat> but, like I said, we're going to sum this up as best we can because it's a long history with, with the Russian Empire or the Imperial Russian Monarchy. And I bet a lot of y'all are wondering, well, why tell us this? Well, in order to understand 19th century Russia, we must first understand the origin of the Russian people. We must first understand uh, who they were and where they came from. And how the Romanov, power, Romanov family had actually came to power in the first place. To understand the or to understand present day, we must first look at the origin. I'll give you a few facts on Russia as the or their origin story, so to speak. Uh, Russia was actually a multinational uh, society. They actually had a. Uh, most Slav tribes uh, lived in these lands for that, and from 1000 BC, many of them were known would be known as uh, the Great Russians. Uh, on a side note, Russia and Sweden have always been warring. They have been warring since the 16th century. It was actually uh, invaders that kept invading the lands of the original Russian people. And uh, most of these Vikings that came down and invaded into Russia uh, actually mixed into the with the local Slavs, Balts, and Finns. Uh, there was actually a time where it was known as the Midnight Century, where Scandinavian Vikings came from the north and conquered almost all the land and all the people. That just gives you a small gist of what the Russian origin story were or was. And when you read more into that chronicle, you can kind of see, you know, these, these Russian people have some grit. <clears throat> now, before I get into the reign of Alexander I and Nicholas I and kick off this whole jumpstart into the high points of Russia or the Russian uh, monarchy, I have to first talk about, well... A little thing that was going on at this time that was a known as the French Revolution. And if most of y'all don't know what the French Revolution was, well, in 1789, there was an uprising in France that most people know as the French Revolution. This was the first time in Europe, in European history, that a Christian monarchy had actually fallen by its own citizens, or at least that was what most believed. From where I stand and I see this revolution, as I see it as a giant coup. A coup led by a political party that started in France in response to the failures of the monarchies. And there were about two main ones. There were the Jacobins and the Girondins. And it's crazy, when you look at the Girondins and the Jacobins, you kind of look at them as how the Republicans and the Democrats are today. It's 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 crazy comparison when you when you look at how the these two parties were and then you see how today's political parties are, are, are uh, you see the correlation between the two but to give the Jacobins a more modern definition besides just calling them Democrats it, it's easier to say that they were far leftists you know they were radical liberals or radical Democrats another definition I give them is terrorists and I'm gonna give you the definition of a ter what a terrorist is terrorist is a person who uses unlawful violence and intimidation, especially against civilians in the pursuit of political aims. That is the Urban Dictionary definition of what a terrorist is. Now, why would I call the Jacobins terrorists? Well, a lot of things happened. I'll put it to you that way. Well, uh, when this French Revolution was going on. But the Jacobin Club 
existed from 1789 to 1799. It only lasted 10 years, and I wonder why. Well, the first leader, and I do apologize uh, beforehand. I am terrible with pronouncing French names, uh, but I'll do my best. So apologies beforehand. Don't brutalize me for it. Uh, the first leader was Antoine Bonnevé. Barnave. <laughs> Their last leader was Maximilien Rosper, Ross Pierre. The motto of these Jacobins was live free or die. Now that is probably radical as it can get. Either you're going to live free or you're going to die for it. And it's, well, it's a good saying, but coming from these people, eh, not so much. Maximilian Rosper is probably who I'm going to be talking about the most because this guy was the architect of what the Reign of Terror. And the Reign of Terror, I'm gonna go into detail about it. It's just something that I fear the most right now in this nation. Uh, even in modern times, I fear another Reign of Terror happening. But uh, Maximilian was the architect of this thing and I'm gonna go into detail in a minute. But let me give you a little facts about who Maximilian is. He was known as the incorruptible for his dedication to the civil morality. You're going to find out in a minute why he that, that was not very true. That civil morality that he lived by led to the arrest of many. In December of 1792, he promoted and pushed for the execution of King Louis XIV. Now, I know a lot of things with King Louis. With King Louis, um, people would say, well, he did deserve it. You know, he, he deserved to, to get executed for the betrayals that he had for the, the French people. Uh, that's what they'll tell you in, in most history books that he deserved it. And of course, he kind of did, but many of the population of France were not willing to do this. As I mean, most of the population of France, I mean, it was split up in the three different divisions. It was the, the peasants, the nobility, and then it was the uh, merchants. It was the three separate. And then, of course, you got the king on top. But that, that's how it was separated out. And the majority of the population, except for you know most of the nobility, did not want to execute the king. They actually wanted to exile him, but did not want to kill him. But Maximilian Rospierre promoted this, and he pushed it and, and swayed people as much as, they, as he could to execute the king. In May of 1793, he encouraged people to rise up in an insurrection over military defeat and food shortages. This is what gave him the opportunity to be able to purge the Girondins. Now the Girondins were, I'm not gonna give them a pass. They were about the same way as the, the Jacobins were, but they just weren't as uh, radical with their ideas. They were really more to talk it out than really fight about it. But with this, after he was able to execute the king, or get the king to be executed, and he started this uprising, he gained control in July of twenty July twenty seventh, seventeen ninety three, as re, as a regent. But he exercised dicta dictatorial power over France. With threats of civil war and foreign invasion, the reign of terror was born. What I mean, what is meant by that is that his his policies and his dictatorial power made the people not want him to be king or made, made him not want to be president or whatever they had at the time. He was just a regional. He was kind of a guy that they just appointed at, the, at that point just so they have somebody there. And uh, he kind of let it go to his head. But when people were ready to start a coup to get rid of him, this is where the reign of terror came. Now the reign of terror, I guess I should have explained this earlier. The Reign of Terror was a time period in France, and it lasted for almost maybe almost a year, uh, when you could say the lightest things, but if it is taken as against the monarchy or against the government of France, you will be tried and executed with no trial of your peers and no ability to represent yourself. It could just be the littlest things of like, I hate this country, or I don't like, you know, Rossberry, and he'll take that as you're a revolutionary, you're here to bring the downfall of this government, 
and they most people were sent to the guillotines. This is what Ross Pierce started. Three hundred thousand suspected enemies were arrested. Ten thousand of them died in prison. Seventeen thousand were officially executed in less than a year. Let that sit for a minute. Less than a year, almost twenty-seven thousand people were killed either by execution or died in prison and the execution method that they chose was not a very humane one it was uh, death by a guillotine now a guillotine is a big contraption where a big piece like a knife or some type of a blade is on top and it's on top of a pulley your head is 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 locked in and when the executioner in time is ready to go, they're gonna release it and the giant blade is gonna chop your head off. That was how 17,000 people were executed via Ross Spears' reign. And it's safe to say that he kinda of did let the power kinda of go to his head just, just a little bit, but he purged many innocent people, uh, many Jacobins, I mean, a lot of people feared this man. On June 6th, 1794, he finally became president of France. Less than six days later, on June 10th, 1794, after being elected, he passed a law that suspended a suspect's right to a trial and legal assistance, meaning he can try you for anything that he wants. You have no right to a trial and you have no right to legal assistance. You have no right to representation. Eventually, he was arrested after a month. 1,300 people were guillotined during this time. In less than a month, he, he was president, and 1,300 people were guillotined. On July the 27th, 1794, on the next evening when he was arrested, he and 21 others were guillotined in Paris. Now, that showed you that was the ultimate karma for him. I mean, all the deaths and everything, I mean, that, that came to come back and bite him. The directory that followed him, they saw the same as he was. It was corruption, military failures. I mean, it was just, they just couldn't find anybody that, to take over France and, and be able to lead it to the, to the promised lands. And the end result of that basically led for the uprising of one Napoleon Bonaparte. As a result of what the Jacobins did, France has never been the same. With the execution of King Louis, even though it was warranted, there was no going back. None of the people knew this. They didn't realize this until after the fact, until after King Louis was, was killed, that there was no going back. And even if you look at France today, you know, you look at their history since 1794 with the execution of King Louis XIV. Where are they now? They're still re they're still revolting against the government. They're still, you know, the people are still not happy. And I don't say it as though France is, is a bad nation. I think that they have, you know, the right people that are ready to stand up for themselves. They just need the right people in office and the right people in government to help them out and, and stop all this. But it was like I said, the people never really wanted to kill the king. They just wanted to exile them. Now, Many of you will probably think that this is just the end of the story of the French Revolution and oh, okay, you know, they, they got the Jacobins, you know, they're, they're executed. Uh, most of them were exiled or fled. Well, kind of wonder where they fled to. Is it coincidence that 30 years after the event, another uprising took place in another country ruled by a monarchy on the 14th of December, 1825 in the city of St. Petersburg, Russia. This uprising took place on the first day of the reign of Nikolai Petrovich, or better known as Nicholas I. 